Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, quick heads up before you watch this video with Max. The audio is terrible, so if you're all into the audio and less about the content and the substance, you might want to completely skip this video. If you're in it for the content and you are a big fan of Max Joseph or want to know more about who he is, highly recommend watching this. Max is a master filmmaker. Great stuff. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Max Joseph. I'm a filmmaker, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with filmmaker Max Joseph. Max, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Max, did you ask my guest how'd you get this job? Um, yeah, that's interesting because I don't have a job. Um, not, you know, I don't, I don't work for anyone per se. I do a bunch of different things. Um, I work for myself, which is, I'm probably like the worst boss of myself that there could be. Um, Why are you such a bad boss? Because I'm always harping on myself to do more. That there's never, I'm, I'm never doing enough. Uh, I'm never satisfied with what I'm doing. I need to be doing more. And when it, when it comes time to go on vacation or have a weekend off, that's just more opportunity to do more stuff. Um, so, me being a boss myself, I never really let myself off the hook for, to work, and, and it kind of drives me crazy sometimes. There's a lot there that I want to unpack, but before we go there, let's step back just a couple steps and give the audience a little bit of context about who you are and where they might recognize you from. Obviously, uh, you are part of that long-running successful show, Catfish, with Neve. Yep. Uh, talk about some of the other projects you're working on, and then let's dive deeper into the mind of Max Joseph? Uh, sure. So I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. I was a filmmaker before Catfish. Uh, I started as an editor and then kind of worked my way up to directing. I've done, uh, I've done commercials. I've done web videos. I did a feature uh, with Zach Efron called We Are Your Friends. Um, I'm working on scripted shows and another feature. And, uh, but I also just really like making uh, videos for the internet. Yeah, your recent documentary um, is interesting. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so um, basically while I was making my movie, uh, you know, that, that's like a two and a half, three year process. And it was the longest I'd worked on one single project. Uh, of course, I was doing Catfish 2 at the time, and so there was some back and forth in terms of brain space, some directed towards Catfish, most directed towards the movie, but after working on something for three years, I, I had all these like little ideas or, or smaller ideas that I really wanted to dive into. And I was approached by a new social media uh, platform called Vero. Uh, and they we were talking and they liked some of these little ideas I had about small video essays that I wanted to make about certain topics. And one of them was about leadership and whether or not you had to compromise your own nature to be a good leader, whether or not you needed to be a dick or an asshole or any of those things that we associate with kind of, you know, successful entrepreneurs or, or really successful leaders. I mean, some people don't, but I think right now, where we're at as a society, we you know we hold up Steve Jobs and look who's president. Like there, there is a sense that you have to be a jerk uh, in order to lead. And I certainly was asking myself and grappling with that as I was directing a, a feature film, which had you know a lot more people than I'm used to managing. Um, and so I was really interested in that, and I wanted to explore it. And so I interviewed a number of directors and filmmakers, people have worked with big directors, and I read a bunch of books on the subject and talked to experts, and I just wanted to figure it out for myself and, and also kind of uh, show my journey so that maybe it would help someone else on, on their journey as well. And what did you find out? Um, so obviously you're not that way. Like, I, I see you as the nice guy. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think they, it's not such a clear-cut answer. It's not that you should be a dick or that you, you shouldn't be a dick. I think that, 
you have to kind of figure out who you are naturally and what your natural skill set is. Some people are naturally dicks. They're born dicks. They're, they're, they're amazingly insensitive to other people's feelings, which, which allows them in a lot of ways to be very focused on what they want and, and to kind of pursue that at all costs. Now, that might hurt people's feelings around them. They might step on certain people who get hurt along the way, but sometimes it allows them to be more effective in achieving their goal. But if you're not born that way, I don't think it helps to be a dick because then you'll just end up feeling bad or guilty about being mean or any of those things. But you need to kind of figure out what your personal idiosyncratic skill set is that will unlock people and help them help you achieve that goal. But all that being said, I do think that like there needs to be a baseline killer instinct to a certain degree to, to get what you want. Because at the end of the day, not everyone will love you. People naturally, you know, grumble about their boss and you need to be okay with that. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, I think I am still, you know, dealing with. I, I want everyone to like me, but I also have to realize that they can't and that I can't sacrifice the end result for a pleasant interpersonal interaction. Sometimes in the moment, I just want to please people, but I can't do that at the expense of, you know, the, the final product being compromised. Yeah, I mean, if you have a crew move and you've got to move at noon and it's like 12.30, you've got to kind of crack the whip. Right, you need to crack the whip, or if you've done some good work beforehand, you've partnered with someone else who does have more of that dickish personality and is kind of successful with it. So, know. so what makes someone that way? I mean, because I look at you know, some of these big personalities, right? Like, so type A, but that right. doesn't make someone a jerk, right? Like, so right. Let's, let's define what we're talking about here so that we have some clarity. Sure, well, I, so I interviewed this guy, uh, Aaron James, who's really funny and he's, he's really intelligent. He wrote this book called Assholes, A Theory. And he teaches, he's a professor of philosophy and he, he, this book is actually a pretty rigorous argument of, of a theory of what makes an asshole. And he kind of boils it down to uh, an entrenched sense of entitlement. So it's very selfish. So someone who just naturally believes that they're entitled to certain things, to their opinion, to having things go their way. Yeah. Or the parking and, spot, you know. Right. The parking spot is the perfect example. Or, you know, using the shoulder on the highway to, to pass everyone else. Um, and, and not feeling any guilt or remorse about doing things that naturally take advantage of other people's goodwill. You know, the... He says that the, the asshole exists against the background of most people being cooperative. You know, most people do, they, they've internalized some kind of superego and sense of, you know, serving the community, doing what they should, staying in line, you know, and not rocking the boat. And the asshole, it, you know, can only exist because those other people are mostly doing their part. Yeah, they're trying to keep the social norms or the right. values or everything in check. Right. Oh, that guy's the exception. Right. You know, let's not make that the norm. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I think that entrenched sense of entitlement, you know, I think that it's, it's celebrated to a certain degree in certain types of people. Like, I think white men are able to get away with that entrenched sense of entitlement more than maybe any other type of person. It doesn't fly as well when you're, when you're a female with, with an entrenched sense of entitlement um, or a minority with an entrenched sense of entitlement. There are all sorts of kind of uh, names and, and derogatory terms and, and negative associations with those other types. But when it comes to kind of, there is this myth, this trope of the male tyrant that that is successful and that, that can successfully run a company or a, you know, a country or, and, and we kind of make room for it and that's fucked up, you know? And, and what do you do when you're just not born that way? 
but yeah. you still want to lead a group of people. Yeah, what do you do? Because I'm, I'm in that boat. Right. I'm, I feel like sometimes nice guys can last, and, and I'm always battling with this internally. Like sometimes I feel like if it's a project, okay, I'm hurting cats, and like I don't have one of those voices that projects. So I'm like, hey, everyone, come on over, like right now. And I can't, it's hard for me to even get mad. In fact, when I do get mad, my friends and family laugh at me like, <laughs> like are you kidding me? Like, right. you know, let's get things heated up here. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I used to um, cut director's reels. And I met a lot of directors, television directors. And they were all, you know, they all came from different uh, perspectives. Like some were more stern and dis the disapproving father. Um, but one who ended, who ended up going on to become very successful was this Canadian uh, female director. And she was just very, she, she had this very kind of funny, idiosyncratic, like she gave hugs and was very friendly and used her Canadianness to, as a tool, basically. Warmth. warmth. She was warm. Right. She warmed people up and it didn't, and she used it to disarm people and get what she wants. I mean, all the directors I worked with, no matter how nice they seemed or not nice they seemed, they were all very manipulative. They all knew how to manipulate me to various degrees of success to get what they wanted. Right. Some of them would micromanage, some of them wouldn't micromanage at all. Um, some of them would, right, some would, would, would dangle carrots, you know, if you do this, I'll take you to set. Some of them, you know, wouldn't, and, and so it was a good kind of primer in, in directors and what they're like and, and how to get what they want. But this Canadian uh, director, she, she said to me once that, um, she told me the story about how she was working on this big show and there was this actor that she knew um, always gave, knew the first, always gave directors kind of like a test. Like, because he was difficult and he wanted to see if the director would, would push back or, or how they would deal with him. And if you pass the test, he would kind of lay down and do what the director says. Because, you know, a lot of these, these are big actors, and if the director can't hang or if they're, you know, if, if they're too cowardly or, you know, whatever, then, then they're not going to earn the respect of the actor. The actor's not going to do what the director wants, and the director is going to lose power, you know, publicly, and it's going to feel humiliated. So... You know, this was a, a tense moment, and she she just said, "Oh, in Canada we give hugs, and and you know I'm just you know I'm just making suggestions." And but she basically leaned on this kind of myth of the Canadian warmth and 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 friendliness in order to kind of excuse her her nature, which allowed her like she wasn't she's not a born dick, but she was able to kind of use her warmth as a tool to get what she wants. And, and she, you know, she ended up getting the actor to kind of love her, and she disarmed him, and she got him uh, to do what she wanted. So in that sense, you've got to kind of figure out what tools you have that get what you want. Is it your smile? Is it your ability to listen to other people? Um, can, you, can you win their trust and earn their respect without making them fear you? Right. Do you need to mix a little fear with that love? You know, if, you, if you're always nice, but then once in a while you kind of, you aren't so nice, like, does that, does that kind of freak people out a little and make them want to never see that side again? You know, so I think, again, I don't know. I'm, I'm openly asking the question and, and still learning all these things too. It sounds like what you're saying is that your best advice is to be yourself and to react, uh, you know, based on the circumstances and conditions. So yes, but yes, but you can be yourself, but you need to. It's it's less being yourself because if you're just yourself, like you know, you're you're voicing your insecurities. You're you're just being everything that you are. It's more like learning. It's more like playing to your strengths than being yourself. Playing to your strengths is, is accepting who you are and saying, I know that these things that I do are effective and I know that these things that I do are not as effective. So I'm going to kind of hide 
a little bit the things that I know aren't effective and lean into the things that I do that are effective. And there is an element of learning new behaviors or correcting behaviors that you have. If you just say be yourself, that means just like letting it all hang out. Right. Which, unfortunately, I don't think is the right answer. I think it's a matter of, okay, I'm gonna, I know that these things that I do naturally work and I'm gonna lean in on them. And the things that I don't, and things that I do that I know might kind of undermine my authority or um, make me less effective as a leader, I'm going to try to correct and, and kind of build on them. Yeah, so in making dicks, I also like kind of identified a line, kind of a dividing line between being a dick because for, out of your own ego, because just like, oh, I don't like this, like, and you throw the bottle at someone, or, or you disagree with someone because you need to be the smartest person in the room. Like, that's out of ego. And everyone senses that and smells that, and, and no one will respect you for that. They might, they might kind of heed, they might kind of uh, appease you in the moment, but you'll lose respect, I think, from people if you're constantly a dick out of your own ego. But if you are naturally curt, or if you, if you have kind of a, a finished product or a vision in mind that you're trying to get to, <clears throat> and it's a compelling vision, and that's kind of why everyone signed on because they have respect for you and because you're trying to get somewhere. And if, and if you're curt and you, and you kind of like, no, that's not it, or yeah, no, no, do that instead of that. Like if you're, if you're kind of being a dick out of a sense of needing to get to that finished product, then I think no one really takes it personally. It's forgiven. Yeah. It's forgiven and it's like, no, we're, we're actually, we're on our way to get somewhere exciting and this person is leading us and I believe in him or her and sure, like, they don't have time to make, to pat me on the back and make me feel good and warm, but that's okay because we're on our way to, to somewhere exciting. Yeah. But if you're doing it out of some knee-jerk reaction of just like, no, you're stupid and your ideas are dumb, and I'm just saying that because it wasn't my idea, yeah. then then that's that falls into the kind of not good category. Yeah, it's the <clears throat> Devil Wars Prada versus maybe Elon Musk. Right? Like Elon is, I'm sure, you know, what does he have? Like five minutes per project with all the things that he's working on. Right. And you know, I've heard these stories about just how he's relentless and you know, of course he's been through a, several relationships that he's burned bridges and but he's certainly got this vision to change the world, whether it's land on Mars or, you know, have to make sure that we're all driving electric cars. The Devil Wears Prada, Steve Jobs kind of paradigm. At the end of the day, for better or worse, if you can constantly produce successful things over and over again, people give you the leeway to be as nasty as you want to be. And that's... I think that's just the way things are. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate, but it is the truth. Talk about that, uh, the last director that you talked to that canceled on you and canceled on you. and um, Talk about his case, because I thought it was very interesting in the, in the documentary. Yeah, so, you know, it was hard, it's hard to get interviews with people, uh, as I'm sure you know. Sometimes Not you if you're to, me, I mean, it's right. fairly, fairly easy. A lot of people actually come to me. Right, right, they're, they're banging on your door and yeah. you're, you're, you got to turn them all down. So many. That's why I'm here. Um, so um, for this, for Dix, I ended up interviewing a lot of people that I knew or could get in touch with. A lot of directors are super busy and they don't like doing press or any kind of interviews in general because either they're, they're busy making their thing or they don't want to talk about their process. And so I mostly interviewed people I knew. But there was one director that, you know, I interviewed Davis Guggenheim and he suggested that I interview his old friend Peter Burke, who is more of this kind of stern authority figure type of director, this alpha male director. And I'd heard stories of Pete Burke. He has a reputation of being tough. Um, and he's like, he's definitely more of, the, of a general. I mean, he makes films about battle and, and sports and, 
and he has this kind of like man's man, you know, World War II general quality about him. Yeah, I mean, he hangs out with Mark Wahlberg. Right, right. Yeah. right. These are tough guys. Uh, so I was like, I need this perspective in this documentary because everyone I'm interviewing is kind of falling on the nice guy side of things, the kind of more mensch-like, kind of open-minded. I want to talk to someone who is more of a hard ass and does get things done that way. And so that would be Pete Burke. And so I, I reached out to him through a mutual friend and he amazingly was very responsive and he said, come up to Boston. I'm shooting a, a, a movie there. He was shooting Patriot's Day with Mark Wahlberg. And, and we'll do the interview there. And I was like, wow, that was great. Very, that was easy. Like, this guy's totally fine. Uh, and then I went up to Boston and literally, as I was on the curb hailing a taxi, I get an email from his assistant who tells me that, you know, that, they're, that filming is, is more difficult than they thought and, and Pete's really busy and, and can we do the interview when he finishes the movie back in LA. He canceled on me last minute. Canceled on me last minute. I was there in Boston, had already you know, booked my hotel and had flown there obviously and had a return flight. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that sucked. And, and then as, you know, as months went on, I knew he was back in LA, I, I reached out to him and he kind of was avoiding me or wouldn't respond. And I was like, what do I have to do to get this guy to, to, and it, to, to respond to me? And then it kind of became like a challenge. It was like, well, how can I get this, this alpha, this stern guy who kind of fits within the dickish leader mentality, like how can I get what I want out of him? How can I out dick Pete Burke, <laughs> right? And, and so I... What'd you do? Well, I became friendly with his assistant. And I, I finally got him to agree. I kind of was forceful with him in a, in a text message. I sent, and this is all in the doc. Um, I sent him a text message and I said, hey, you know, I went up to Boston and you, you know, you, you kind of, you flaked on me and that wasn't cool. And now I'm back in LA, I'm trying to make this like, I, you know, you'd be in good company with this thing. I've interviewed a bunch of really great directors. I really think you'd be great, but like, you know, can, can, we, can we make this happen or not? Because i got to finish soon. And I was kind of like, I was kind of more forceful. And he wrote me back being like, look, I don't even know you. But talk to, talk to Lauren, my assistant, and, and we'll try to work something out. So it was funny. It was like he barked, I barked at him. And he barked back at me. But he didn't say, go fuck yourself. I never want to talk to you again. You know, take a hike. He was like, he actually granted me... He actually was like, okay, we'll, we'll make this happen. Interesting. Some, I mean, like, again, like part of being a leader or director or, or being effective at all is like everyone is different and everyone reacts to different things. Some people need to be coddled. Some people need force. Sometimes fire, sometimes you do fight fire with fire. Sometimes you don't. And, and each person needs to, you know, you need to, under, you need to be like a Swiss army knife. Yeah. I guess. And like, you know, a different tool for, for different people. So I finally went and met him, but he said, no cameras. I just want, I just want to meet you and just kind of see what, what this is about. So I met him for like five minutes. I didn't bring any cameras. He changed the location on me like twice on my way to meeting him. First, he wanted me to meet him at his gym, his like boxing gym, which I thought was like an amazing intimidation move. Because he's like a boxer. Again, it's a very man, manly, man's man thing. And then as I was on the way to the gym, he was like, no, no, no. I, his assistant called me. He's like, no, no, no. Uh, meet us at the office. So I, like, I, went and met, I went to the office. Then I had to wait like 20 minutes, you know, of course. Total power moves. Yeah, all power moves. Yeah. But he didn't seem like he was like purposefully, like I, I just feel like this is naturally him. He's just doing his thing. And, you know, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get something from him. So I've got to play ball. So I finally meet him, and I tell him what this is about. And he's like, you know, I'm editing two films right now, um, so it's gonna, my time is really tight, and you know, I, I, thank you for meeting me, and I'll, I'll think about it. And I was wearing a shirt with the title of my film on it called We Are Your Friends. 
Um, and he goes, you know, by the way, your shirt, you should change that shirt to say we are not your friends because enemies are, are more useful than friends. Have you read The 48 Laws of Power? And I said, no. He's like, you got to read that book, The 48 Laws of Power. Use enemies. Mm. I was like, okay. So then I read The 48 Laws of Power, and I saw on the back of the book that the author lived in L.A. This guy, Robert Greene. He's an amazing author. I didn't know about the book. I didn't know about him. I read the book. I've gone on to read two more of his books. They're incredible. But The 48 Laws of Power is this very kind of Machiavellian, you know, it's been criticized as amoral, but it's, it's actually a pretty amazing book. It tells and the truth, probably. It does. It does tell the truth. And it's all about power dynamics. And, and, and Robert Greene's a really fascinating guy and really kind of a genius writer. And I, I, went to, I reached out to him, got him to respond, went to meet him with a hardcover version of the book. Um, had him sign it to Pete Berg, kind of like a special signing. It was the first edition of the book. And then I wrapped the book up and I delivered it to Pete's office and I left it on his desk and two weeks later he granted me the interview. So there's a lot of things that it sounds like you did right that I want to just unpack just sure. for the people who may be kind of following in these footsteps one way or the other. So one, graphic tees always seem to win. I don't know why, it's like, you know, you would either wear your favorite sports team, or there's a saying, or some sort of gesture, and it ev always seems to evoke, at least in my experience, some sort of, it's a conversation starter, or it's, I mean, that was incredible serendipity, don't you think, that he picked apart that saying at that very moment and used it to your benefit, in which then you picked up on what he said, and then you chased that lead to the source of something that he found valuable. Right. And then you wanted to kind of continue to add value by getting a signature from an author that he respected, even go as far as to get like a first edition of the book and then gift it to him. So you're, you're sort of like providing value and giving before you're expecting anything in return. Totally. I mean, this is kind of the Dale Carnegie model of really putting yourself in someone else's shoes and asking what what do they want and how do they feel and how do they see the world? Where, where do they see value? And and that is, is a very invaluable tool if you can do that, if you can kind of empathize and, and see, understand the world through someone else's eyes. And it's, and obviously it's a very underused uh, it, tool. It totally is. And it still boggles my mind how few people I mean, I get these requests at my level, people asking me to do stuff, or like, you know, and I, I call it the ATM syndrome. It's like, what do I look like, an ATM? You come and you get cash uh -huh. out, right, right. and like, you don't put any cash in? Like, I'm not your freaking ATM. Right. Like, tell me how it benefits me first before you ask me for anything. And, and it just amazes me how many people almost like daily, hourly, um, are on that channel of, well, I just need what I want. And they don't think about what I want first because right. I think it's the fastest way to get what you want is to make sure someone else gets what they want first. Right. Especially someone you know who may be in terms of status or reachability far beyond where you are. A hundred percent. And a lot of people don't understand that. And and some people there's there's this great and I'm gonna totally butcher it. There's this great like kind of parable about the, and I'm not going to do it because I'm going to butcher it and I wish I, I could look it up and do it. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but I also realized that when I, when I talked to Pete the first time in his office, I said, I'm, I'm like a, a young filmmaker and I just have a lot of questions I want to ask you about the process and I, and I think you're, you know, you're an accomplished director and I think that, that it would be great, it would be an invaluable tool to, to use in this documentary. And I, and, I, and I presented myself as this kind of like, oh, I'm like a student and like, will you bestow your knowledge upon me? And, and I don't think that got me anywhere. Um, and then when I reached out, because I, I did, I, I went and I got the book signed and I gave it to him, but then I also sent an email to his assistant. I was like, what I didn't tell Pete is that I'm 
the co-host of a show that is, you know, a, a pretty popular show on MTV. I know he's got these two movies coming out. My, you know, my social media audience is this big. You know, I've, I, I'd be happy to help promote the film or, or, you know, when this film, when this comes out, he, you know, he'd be alongside Davis Guggenheim and John Hamburg and these other really big filmmakers. And, and I kind of like, in thinking about what I said to him, I was like, I was just talking about me and my, my project. And I wasn't thinking in terms of what he wants, which is, well, he's got these two films coming out. He really cares about them. I'm someone who has a, a pretty decent social media following. Like, if I can help promote those films, then that is something that is valuable to him because I'm on TV and have an audience. Why don't I lead with that now instead of, oh, I'm just a young filmmaker and will you? And, and I think that that also helped. Yeah, yeah. I want to change gears a little bit and I want to go back to maybe um, younger Max and did you always want to be in entertainment? Did you always, did you always want to be a filmmaker, storyteller? Yeah. Um, I think as a kid, I, I, was, I did a lot of acting, and then I got into writing, and then writing and acting, like directing was a part of that, because I was always in theater stuff at school. Um, and I went to acting school for uh, a few years, and... I really loved acting, but then everyone, and when you're young, everyone's like, well, don't be an actor because it's impossible and it's a tough life and everyone warns you against it. And somehow I listened to that and got into writing and directing. Um, and along the way, I was, I was always a computer nerd as well, just separately. And I was like into websites and, and, and the internet and all that stuff. And I... Once like Final Cut Pro came out and you could make films on the computer, like that was kind of like, that was the most fun thing ever. And all of a sudden I was like, this is all I want to do is, is film stuff and then get back to my computer and, and kind of put it together. Um, and that led to editing, which led back to directing and so on and so forth. So with, with all the, the content that's out there, whether that's, you know, TV, movies, digital, you know, internet, social media, etc. Do you think now is the best time to create something new or the worst time? It's a loaded question, uh, and it's a good question. I think that I think that movies. It's a really tough time to make the movies that I think we all love. I mean, sure, it's a great time for Marvel movies and big, big budget tentpole movies. Um, but, you know, I, I was a child of the 90s. I was a teenager in the 90s. And so that's kind of when I fell in love with movies. And, you know, kind of all the Miramax films from the 90s, mid, mid 90s, like, you know, Pulp Fiction or Train Spotting or all these kind of cult. Uh, these cult indie films that crossed over into the mainstream. And I think that those films are getting increasingly harder to make and to come out and kind of cut through the noise. They're going more to TV. TV is obviously having a moment um, and, and will probably continue to have a moment. Movies, anyway, you're saying, what is it, what was your question? So is now the best time or the worst time? <laughs> And if it's, if it's the worst time, why? If it's the best time, why? I think that the internet has really democratized the ability to create stuff. YouTube, you even said it yourself. When YouTube came out, you realized that you could do this and have a distribution model to do what you wanted to do without having to kind of jump through all the hoops that, you know, all these directors have had to jump through, whatever. It, it, it's leveled the playing field and it allows for a lot of different voices to be heard, which is amazing. Of course, the paradox is that so many voices are speaking that it's cacophonous and it's hard to make, to make out, you know, to have something cut through the noise. But I think, I mean, I'm very energized by, by this moment that we're in because yes, on the one hand, making kind of those awesome cult indie features is harder. But I think that the internet is really 
is really go it's still like there's still so much potential around what can be done with web content. And I think that we've only really scratched the surface. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you think about it, what are we 15, 18, maybe 20 years in at most? I would say really we're only like, yeah, maybe 15 years into like really like harnessing web content. I mean, I would say the sale of YouTube was kind of like the starting gun. It's 2005. So yeah, we're like 12-ish yeah. years into it. And uh, let me just stop yeah, and yeah. give some perspective, which is this. I, I heard this really cool kind of context, which is the flight of the Wright brothers and the landing on the moon, I think, was only about 60 or 70 years apart, which is pretty incredible when you think about it, Wow! right? Wright brothers, yeah, yeah. very first flight, and then freaking stepping on the surface of the moon. You know, in someone's lifetime, right, they saw that happen. And so if we're just talking about 10, 12, 15 years of internet, I mean, wow, we can probably go a long ways in a short time, right? And so yeah. I guess it gives me, I'm very optimistic about it. I'm very bullish that there's lots more to do. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of room for growth. And, and what's really exciting is that there's a community that is pushing things forward. You know, I think that... And what is that community? Well, I think the YouTube community and this community of creators are like, they're looking at each other and saying, you know, we're on to something new. I don't really think I'm part of that community, but I'm, I, I see it. I think you're part of that community, so... Uh, I mean, I, I admire that community, and I, I think that there's a great sense of camaraderie, and, and people want to see each other succeed. They want to see the community succeed. And what, what really excites me about, about internet films is that right now, it is... A, they are the things that cut through the noise. Like if you have a million things to do today and someone, someone today said, oh, you really have to see this movie. And someone else said, you really have to watch this series. It's amazing. And someone else just sent you a video with a link. The first thing you do out of those three things is click on the link and watch that video. Because you can do it now and you can kind of procrastinate with, from whatever you're supposed to be doing with that thing. And in that sense, it goes to the top of the pile and is the most kind of, it's the most relevant format, I think, of what's going on right now. Like, watching a two-hour film is, is work, and we have so much content flying at us that, like, to put aside two hours to watch a movie, that better, that movie better be great. Yeah, and we have to deliberately escape. Whereas, right. if we have our phones, it literally never leaves our side, or it's more, you know, only like a foot away, and it's so accessible. That's what right. we're talking about. Yeah, but like, and if that and if that video contains an idea, then it's so easy to then share that idea once you've seen it to share it with your audience. I mean, going viral, which is obviously a term that's almost lost its meaning at this point because we use it so much. But like, it's hard for a movie. I mean, movies do go viral. Blair Witch. Right, big movies go viral, but like, small movies now go viral. I mean, fifteen years ago a small movie didn't do anything. Short film didn't do anything. Now, a short film can go more viral than, than the majority of movies that come out, than 90% of movies that come out, which is insane when you think about what you can put into a small video, idea-wise, content-wise, the ability that it has to galvanize a, a community, a population, to implant ideas. I don't know, that to me, is very exciting. And, and beyond that, I don't think that there, there isn't a practiced, rehearsed um, way of consuming digital content. We're still figuring it out. The rules are still being written. Whereas with films and TV shows, there are armies of critics. There are, you know, there's Rotten Tomatoes. They're, they're, everyone sees the trailer and they go on, they go on Twitter and they they say, oh, this looks like it's going to be terrible. Oh, this looks like it's going to be great. And they hype it up or they, they look... Any, but there's such a rehearsed industry around the consumption of those things right. that it almost like dissects it before the thing even comes out. Whereas with web videos, it's like we're still figuring out how to consume them. Well, and I think the other point worth saying is that these creators, you know, now that they're going direct, direct to audience, 
and you've kind of said it without saying it, is you're cutting out a lot of the, the middleman, the process, the clutter. But these, and I think of maybe like Casey Neistat, for example, you know, who's a great example of someone who's going direct to audience, who is fully capable of going mainstream but has deliberately chosen not to so that he can maintain control, right? And so whether it's someone like Casey or whether it's some of these uh, other vloggers who are doing daily stuff or they have series, they have the ability to talk right to their audience and say, you know, this is just you and me. They don't care about millions and billions and whatever of either dollars or budget or executive teams. They just need the right number to accomplish whatever they're trying to do. And that could be a thousand views, or that could be a hundred thousand views, but they've got it so uh, built, designed, and locked into their um, purview that no one else matters. Yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, Casey is amazing at what he does, and he really has, you know, he lives his art. You know, and I think that, especially, you know, what what's so amazing to me about Casey and, and a bunch of these creators is that they've really turned uh, filmmaking into a sport. You know, they do it every day. Um, they're disciplined about it. They, it's like, they, it's like practicing every day. Um, they, I don't know how they do They're that. out there on the field. You know, they're, they, they interact with their fans and the, the artwork in itself is the totality of what they're doing and the and the rhythm at which they're doing it more so than any one particular piece. It's like, you know, the the art when when you're an athlete, the pro your your final product or the things you're you're most proud of is not a single game, but generally a season, right? Or or multiple seasons. Like a baseball team. Like, I don't know how many games a baseball team plays. In, in, right. But that's what being a, a, a kind of vlogger, um, internet creator, YouTube filmmaker is like. It's about being prolific and it's about staying constant. And I'm very hard at those things. For me, I'm, I'm too much of a perfectionist and I work too long on one thing to get it perfect because I'm still, I still have too much of the old way of doing things kind of, you know, ingrained in my, in my head. But, but Casey has this ability to just, he's living his art. His, his, his life that he's architected for himself is the artwork. And the videos are small glimpses into that. And that's a huge and exciting paradigm shift from, you know, pr end product based films to process based films. So if someone is creative, because I know a lot of people watch the show, they're, they're entrepreneurs, they're in the struggle, or there are creators, maybe they have a YouTube channel or aspiring, aspire to be. What would you say, kind of in conclusion here, that we should be measuring? Like, what's the measure of success? How do we define success in this creator space? You know, there's beyond the vanity metrics, you know, what should we be looking at? How do we know whether we should keep going on this path or we should cut bait and get a real job like, you know, maybe the peanut gallery wants us to do? I think this is the real job. I mean, I if you do this right, then, then it becomes the real job. And, and that's what's so exciting. Of course, I, you know, I sometimes fear what is, what is a society full of creators do? Does it just implode? Because who's, who's manning the, the controls? Who's actually in the infrastructure making things work? But that's another conversation. Who's doing the math? Right. But I think that... It's tough. How do you measure success when you're a creator or a vlogger or kind of an entrepreneurial artist, which is kind of what we're talking about? Um, and I struggle with that every day. Um, I think it comes down to what turns you on. And what turns you on in a, in a, sustainable, in a sustainable way, not in a like quick quick instant gratification, but, but then kind of yucky feeling kind of way. If you're just doing it for the likes, I think you'll ultimately find that, that it's empty because, because likes will, you know, it, you're, you start going on this treadmill and then you can't get off of it. And then you're imprisoned by this thing and, and it's a prison of your own making. 
And then once you step off of it, the likes go down and then the hate starts. There's a lot of, you know, the, if you're just doing it for the audience and for that gratification, then that's a dangerous game. I think it has to do completely with how much you love the process. I know that if I spend, no matter what I'm doing, and look, work is work, even though I'm doing what I love, you know, some days are hard and it just becomes work because you've signed on to do something and you're like, oh, dude, now I've got to actually finish this thing and uh, today I don't feel like it, but I have to. And if, if for one hour a day you're doing something that you love doing, I lose, when I'm at my edit station, I lose myself in what I'm doing. If I make a good edit or if I'm writing and I, and I write a good line or something clicks, I'm out of time. I'm, I'm not existing in time. I'm not looking at the clock. Time is going, you know, time is, is flying. And if I just do that one hour a day, it's like I'm so happy afterwards. Just, just, that, just getting that little bit of satisfaction. I think that if the process of what you're doing gives you any sense of calm or, or pleasure or, or puts you in that euphoric state for, for however much time, then, then you've got to follow wherever that's leading you. Because I, I, I think that that, that ha what, what else, what else is the, the, what other feedback is there to tell us that where we should be going other than that?